Mark 1, starting at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And that's where we'll stop for now. So heaven is a real place where Jesus Christ sits at the Father's right hand. There's a real place that is called heaven, and it's a real place where we go after we die, or our souls go after our bodies pass away. So I want to first put that out there, that heaven is a real place. Heaven is not a place on earth. Heaven is a real place where we go, and where Christ is seated, and where he is reigning. But I do want to also mention that it is possible to become too infatuated with heaven, the afterlife. It's possible to be just focused on it too much. There's a lot of books out there on near-death experiences, and they sell very well. I looked up some of them. 90 Minutes in Heaven by Don Piper sold 7.5 million copies, and it's in over 40 languages. There's a book called Proof of Heaven by Dr. Eben Alexander. That sold 2 million copies. And then there's Heaven is for Real by Todd Burpo, and that sold over 10 million copies. So heaven is something that lots of people are are interested in. And there's even, it's even, because there's so many books on it, it's actually been called the heaven tourism genre. We have a whole genre of books now that are based on this. And I don't want to say these books are bad, but it is possible to be too infatuated with heaven or infatuated with it for the wrong reasons. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Heaven is actually more a person than a place. Heaven, at least the way we talk about it, is actually more a person than a place. When we think of heaven, we think of a place, usually, but we think of something wonderful. We think of something delightful, where there's light and and those sorts of things. And that is more associated with a person than a place. And wherever that person is, that is where heaven is. The kingdom of heaven begins with Christ's first coming and completes with his second coming. So when Jesus first came into this world, that's when the kingdom started. That's when it was inaugurated. And when Christ came into this world, heaven came down into this world. So one way to think about it, maybe you've been before in this room that is pitch black. You're in an auditorium and and you're going to watch a performance of some kind and it's pitch black and you can't see anything. There's all these people around. You can hear these people, but, but you can't see anything. And then all of a sudden comes this spotlight on somebody on the stage. And you can see that person very clearly because there's a lot of light shining on one person. And then afterwards... You go from this dark room, let's say, into a bright sunny day, and you know how your eyes have time to, need time to adjust to that? Because it's just so bright, and it's not just bright in one spot, it's bright all over the place. That's, that's kind of like the kingdom of God. When Christ came into this world, we had light. It was a spotlight. It was on one person. It was on who he was. 
But there was light, and we could see because of his light, even though we were in the dark. One day, Jesus is going to come again, and the light is not going to just be on one person. It's going to be bright for everybody. We're going to go from this amount of light to a bright, sunny summer day. So that's like the kingdom. The kingdom started when Christ came the first time. It's going to be completed when he comes the second time. If you look at Jesus' teaching, he didn't preach an opportunity to go to heaven. That's sometimes how we talk about it. That's not how he talked about it. If you look at verse 15 again, he says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He's saying it's now. Jesus came preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And it was, it's not just in this passage. There's a bunch of others also. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said that a number of times in the gospels. And so the kingdom begins now. It's not you can go to heaven someday if you believe what I tell you. It's, no, the kingdom of heaven is here. It's now. In verse 15, both fulfilled and at hand, those words there are emphasized. So when, when I translated this passage, those words came first. You always know, <laughs> you always know when the Greek is trying to emphasize something because the word order doesn't matter. In Greek, So when the Greek starts to talk like Yoda, you know that something is being emphasized. So in this case, fulfilled the time is. At hand, the kingdom of heaven is. This is, this is the emphasis here. It's, it's now. It's now. It's fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now. So the time is now. And the place is not out there. It's near. Jesus the King had arrived already to begin his reign. He began to establish his reign on this earth. Now this earth is sinful. There's a lot of things that go on in this world that are not right. We all know this. And we talk about God is in control, and he definitely is. God is in control of all things. Nothing happens that's outside of what he allows but there's a lot of things that go on in this world that it's not exactly how God wants it to be. God doesn't want murders or mental illness or handicaps or wars or genocides or anything like that. God doesn't want those things. He might allow them to accomplish a bigger plan that we don't always know what it is. He might allow them, but it's not that he wants them. He doesn't like them. And so, there's a lot of things that go on in this world that are not the kingdom of God. So, maybe think about it this way. If you've ever been to a house or an apartment or a place where you moved out of, but then you went back after somebody else has lived there, and when you go back to a place where you've lived before, there's a, new, there's a new administration there. There's new owners. And so they don't decorate like you decorated. Their, the colors are different. The furniture is set up differently. And there's different furniture in there. And, and maybe they replace the drapes and other things like that. So it's, it's, like, it's kind of a weird feeling because you used to live there and it used to look this way. And when you used to walk in here, you used to feel like, okay, this is my house. And then now, it's, it's all different. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a strange thing. It's not your house anymore. So, in a similar way, God's kingdom is where God is in charge. So, if you're, if you're in this house that you used to live in, 
You're not in charge there anymore. It doesn't look like how you would have made it look. You're not in charge there anymore. God's kingdom is where God is in charge, free from dysfunction and disobedience. So right now, God has sovereignty over what happens, but there's a lot of things that go on that are not right, that are not good, that are not godly, that are sinful and wrong. And this is not the way God wants it to be. Again, he might allow it, but it's not how he wants it. So when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it means God's holiness and glory in his heavenly throne room are so overwhelming that all creatures there honored him with unqualified voluntary service. On earth, however, creatures rebel and refuse to acknowledge God as king and evil kingdoms rise up to oppose his kingdom. The hope that scripture presents from cover to cover is that this disparity between the heavenly throne room and the earth will one day be eliminated. So one day the kingdom is going to come in all its fullness. And there's going to be a new order. An order where God is completely in control, where he wants Everything happens is the way that he wants it. And when Christ came that first time, it was starting then. The light of the world was then shining into darkness, as it says. Truth was overcoming falsehood. There were a lot of misconceptions about who God was and what he expected, and Jesus was setting people straight. So truth was entering into the picture like it hadn't before. Um, Satan was outdone by Jesus in the desert. That was part of what we read too. We know from the other Gospels that Jesus was tempted three times and he, he beat Satan. He got the best of them. And D- Jesus was driving demons. Demons were being driven out. Satan's rule was being overthrown. God's rule was breaking in. Jesus at one time says, If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, i.e. now. And the effects of the fall into sin were being reversed. You notice in verse 13 that it says, He was with the wild animals. Well, there's a passage in Isaiah that I preached on not that long ago where it talks about the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra and the weaned child shall put his hand on an adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So Jesus was with the wild animals in the desert. And he was okay. The kingdom of heaven was near. And he was curing diseases. Blind people were seeing. Storms were calmed. And the dead were rising. The kingdom of heaven was near. Now, there's other times where the kingdom is said to be later. The kingdom is both now and later. So, uh, sometimes Jesus would talk about it as being later. So, he says, I tell you, on the Last Supper, when he was celebrating that, he passed the cup by. He says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So, my Father's kingdom, it's coming. Another time he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And another time he says, I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So it's coming. Similarly, the Bible describes eternal life as both now and later. The kingdom is now and later. Eternal life is now and later too. So, one instance where it's now, this is part of your Bible reading track for today, is 1 John 5, and I have that on the screen, I believe. And this is the testimony 
that God gave us eternal life, gave, past tense, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life, has life already. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You have it now. And there's other times where it talks about eternal life being later, too. So Titus 3, verse 7 is just one of them. So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So it's coming. We have the hope in it. So there's a now and a later. There's other ones I could mention here too. It's now and later. There's, or as the theologians will talk about it, there's the already and there's the not yet. Let's look at the screen here. Let's answer this together. How does the article in the Apostles' Creed concerning life everlasting comfort you? Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy. So after this life, I will have perfect blessedness such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has ever imagined. A blessedness in which to praise God eternally. So I want to call your attention to this here. Notice how it starts. Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy. So there's a beginning now. It starts now. It's going to reach its fullness later, but it starts now. So the blessings of heaven begin now and will be completed in eternity when all is said and done. Christianity is not about holding a ticket to heaven and just waiting for death until you get to go to heaven. I mean, that's that's how... I've thought about it for many years, but that's not really, that's not really the way it is. Or some, some people have abbreviated the word Bible as basic instructions before leaving earth. That, that, kind of, that kind of suggests that heaven is a place where you go and this life is just a test for the next one. We have the kingdom starting now already. We have eternal life beginning now. And it's going to reach its fullness later, but it starts now. Our hope is the person of Jesus Christ, not the place of heaven. The person of Jesus. So if you do read these heaven tourism books, um, they're really fascinating. They're really interesting. It, they're page turners, really, um, and I've read I've read some of them. Um, but I want to encourage you to not put your hope in those testimonies. I mean, those they're they're nice, they're they're cool, they're they're great, but some of them are not very biblical. For example, Doctor Eben Alexander's book, Proof of Heaven only mentions Jesus twice in the whole book and never when he was in heaven. And when he talks about God, he doesn't use the words that we use. Then there's the book, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. Maybe some of you have read that. It was just a couple years ago that that boy said, I made it all up. And uh, I have part of what he wrote up here. He says, I did not die. I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. When I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from lies and continue to. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man cannot be infallible. And I like what he says here. It is only through repentance of your sins and a belief in Jesus as the Son of God who died for your sins, even though he committed none of his own, so that you can be forgiven, 
that you may learn of heaven outside of what is written in the Bible. Jesus Christ is heaven. Not by reading a work of man. I want the whole world to know that the Bible is sufficient. Those who market these materials must be called to repent and hold the Bible as enough. In Christ, Alex Malarkey. The Bible is what gives us the testimony that gives us that eternal life, that hope of it and the present reality of it. There's people who may have gone to heaven, may have had visions or may have had real near-death experience and maybe some of them actually have gone to heaven. But let's not put our confidence in that. Human testimony is fallible. God's word is infallible. Jesus Christ, as Alex Malarkey said, is what saves us. Wherever he is, that's where heaven is. And Jesus Christ is someone we can know and follow right now. We can know him now. We can follow him now. When he is preached, he's as good as right before your eyes. So uh, it's fascinating, in Galatians 3 verse 1, Paul's writing to people who had never met Jesus personally, but he says this, It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. By just preaching him, he's as good as right in front of your face. Before your eyes, he says. You can talk with him now. You can talk with Jesus now. You can talk with him any time. You can have him close now. By the Spirit, he's as close as our own hearts. It begins now. Believers have already passed from death to life. John 5, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. His kingdom can be your heart and life right now. When you own a house or an apartment or a place and you set it up how you would like is Jesus setting up his place in your heart, in your life, in your mind? Or is it yours? When you look at your mind and in your heart, is it set up like you? Or is he reigning there? Is he in charge there? Is he setting it up there? In Ephesians 3, this is Paul praying for the Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, in your hearts, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, so as believers, seek first the kingdom and the king. As it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you as well. Yes, there is a place of heaven where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. Yes, our souls go there after we die. But let's not forget that it begins now. It starts now. Get to know him now. Grow closer to him now. Talk to him now. And let's talk to him. Lord Jesus Christ, you who came into this world and now 
reign in our hearts by the Spirit. Lord, we pray that we would get to know you now. That, Lord, your kingdom would come in our minds and in our hearts and in our lives now. That, Lord, this would be your place for you to set up as you like. And that, Lord, we would see the light that you give. And, Lord, that it would shine through us into even the lives of others. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.